The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Dean Jagger in Nine Men Against the Arctic. Before we begin our show, here's news of an invention from a DuPont research laboratory. DuPont paint technicians have developed a new instrument called a profilograph, so delicate that it will draw the outline of a film of paint only one-fiftieth the thickness of a dime. By pointing out the lows and highs in a film of paint, the profilograph helps DuPont paint laboratories to supply better finishes to the Army and the Navy. Tonight, the Cavalcade of America presents Dean Jagger in an authentic documentary story as starkly dramatic as the courage of the men who enacted it in real life. You will hear from one of these men, Lieutenant W.F. O'Hara, at the end of our play. Our scene is the great ice cap of Greenland, a wilderness of ice as far as the eye can see. Our radio play was written by Paul Peters, and in the role of Captain Armand L. Monteverdi, it stars Dean Jagger. Over the ice cap of Greenland zoomed an American B-17 flying fortress, searching for an army transport plane long overdue. It circled the ice cap in vain and started down the eastern coast. As the weather closed in, Captain Armand L. Monteverde anxiously turned to his co-pilot, Lieutenant Harry E. Spencer. You know, Spence, I don't like this place. Sure is a long way from Texas. You can't see anything. All this whiteness everywhere. No horizon. Now, how high are we, anyhow? I reckon we're plenty high. Can't be sure. Like flying through milk. Yeah, yeah, it is. But I don't like it. What exploded? Sounds like supercharger to me. You know what I think, Spence? I think we're... Spence. Huh? Spence, are you are you hurt? Well, let me feel my legs first. Well, how could we crash? We had altitude, didn't we? I just thought we had. Well, let's see what happened to the crew. Right. right come on back to the bomb bay. Great Scott, look at that fuselage. Oh, it's busted smack in half. O'Hara? Yeah. Lieutenant O'Hara, are you all right? Yeah, I think so. But everything back here has been smashed to pieces. I call her old, Spence. Treat your own, eh? Yeah. Now, answer how you're hurt. Well, I'm just kind of bumped up, sir. How is it? Arms lame, sir. Is it broken? No, sir. It was Charlie host, I guess. Woodell? Feels like I got a shiner on my left eye, sir. Am I right? Yeah, you're right. Best? I think I cut my head a bit, sir. Take a look at him, O'Hara. Where are you? That's a bit old. Spina? Where's Spina? There he is. But he's knocked out I cold. Have... Uh, he, yeah, he's alive, though. Looks like his arm broken. Well, get a blanket for him. How are you feeling, Spina? My hands. My hands. Oh. Yeah, let me see that arm. Does this hurt? I, a little. Don't say a little. If it hurts, holler. It hurts. It's a multiple fracture above the wrist. Let me rig up a splint for him. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Spence. Best. Hang up a top pole and to keep out the wind. Yes, sir. How earth collect the rations? Yes, sir. Now, look, fellas. Now, being stranded on an ice cap in a 40 below blizzard is as new to me as it is to you. So we'll just have to work out our problems together. Can't we communicate with our base? Uh, radio smashed, but how earth now start tinkering on it in the morning? How long do you think we'll be out here, sir? Well, we can't be more than 25 or 30 miles from a weather station. I'd say... Two, three days, five at the most. Boy, when I get back to Waco, I'm going to strip my backyard and just soak up that good Texas sun. You Texans. In California, you, you don't have to go in the backyard for sun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we ought to turn in, Captain. We can keep pretty warm if we wrap up in parachutes and huddle together. Yeah, well, Harold, that's right, man. It's three o'clock and the, the sun's going down. All right, find yourself a roost and perch. 
Shut eye, everybody. Okay. Now, tomorrow we'll look to join over. Then if you've got to get up at night, don't step on the bodies. <laughs> <laughs> For three days, the Willowar wind held them locked like a jailer in that frozen plain. Snow blew into their shelter and sifted into the seams of their clothing. Damp and cold, they waited for the Arctic to relax its grip. But the fourth day dawned bright and clear. It's pretty all right. Yeah, like living in a box of rock candy. Hmm. By the time I get out of here, reckon I'll have seen enough snow to last me the rest of my life. Let's take a walk around and see what we can see, hmm? Take you up on that. We'll be back soon, Marty. All right, don't go far now. All right, outside, men. Everybody, outside. Right. The wind's right. gone down. Hunt around in the snow and collect all supplies. All right. Well, sure it takes your wind. Yeah. My feet are numb. It's like walking on stilts. Yeah. Where are you from, O'Hara? Pennsylvania. Scranton. Married? No. Just got out of college. You? Yes, sir. Three months. Name's Patsy. Cute as a bug. Little, but oh, my, oh, my. Mrs. Lieutenant Harry E. Spencer. That's what the mailman calls her. Mail for Mrs. Lieutenant Harry E. Oh! Hey, Monty! Marty, come here, quick! What's the matter? Well, Spence, he, he just disappeared. A hole opened and he disappeared. Well, hold everything. I'll be right there. Spence. Hey, Spence, are you down there? Yeah. I found him from there. Can you see me? Well, how far down are you? About 100 feet. Over here. On this ledge. Oh, okay, I see you. Hey, take it easy. That ledge doesn't look too solid. Don't worry. I ain't breathing. How far is it to the bottom? Bottom? There ain't no bottom. Just a big black hole down the center of the earth. Hurry up and get me out of here. All right, Spence, just keep quiet. Here comes Marty and the crew with a pile of rope. All right, I got a hundred feet of parachute shroud line. How far down is he? Well, that ought to make it. Here, Best, you're from Texas. Make a sling harness. Give it here. You'll have to watch these ice crevasses. They're covered with snow. You step on them and bang, down you go like falling down an elevator shaft. Right there, sir. I know it's good for steers. All right, Spence. Spence, slip this harness on. Here it comes. You see it? Keep on coming. Will it reach? We're swinging a little. Whoa. But you got it? Man, I'm broke right on it. Okay. Hoist away. And now take it easy, men. All right. Pull. 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 I'd right, hold it a minute. You all right, Spence? Well, rope is slicing hamburger off my ribs. Just keep on pulling. All right, men, once more. Pull. 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 Don't let me down now. We won't let you down. Here, can you reach my hand? Yeah. I got it. All right. Now. Now. Up. Uh, oh. Good boy, Spence. Good boy. You hurt anyway, Spence. How's it feel, Lieutenant? Feel? Feel like... like falling in a cube compartment of a great big refrigerator. <laughs> Yowie! Next time I go underground, I want to be deep in the heart of Texas. <laughs> Five days, six days, eight days, ten days. With tireless patience, they thawed out their radio, patched it up, and sent their anxious voices ringing over the frozen air to the nearest weather station. Back came the reassuring answer. Cheer up, men. We're sending sleds and dog teams to save you. We'll have you here in no time. Out of a bomb site, they built a stove to thaw their rations. With wires, they secured the tail of their plane to the forward part. 
when they discovered their shelter slipping into a crevasse that yawned at their very door. O'Hara's feet were now frozen, and he had to be put to bed beside the injured Spina. Filled with hope, beset by problems, they fought the elements. And then came Thanksgiving. Another helping of that turkey, please. You'll have half a ration K and like it. Mm-hmm. Would you consider me a hog if I ask for just a little more of that chestnut dressing? Oh, Lieutenant, cut it out. What's the matter, Waco? Stomach weak? <laughs> when I think of the way Patsy used Keep to Keep quiet, those... Excuse me, Lieutenant, but I... I keep hearing a motor. Oh, ah, go on, Howard. That's just the electric fan in the parlor. You mean the oil furnace in the basement, don't you? <laughs> Don and I do hear a motor. It's an airplane. Oh. <laughs> Listen, I tell you. Hey! Hey, he's right. Hey, 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 look out, Woodhouse. You're stepping on a harrow. Hey, Cucharoni, take your mittens. Want to freeze your hands? It's a C-54. Boy, oh boy, ain't that pretty. Look. Look, he's wagging his wings at us. Yeah. Uh, I think he's dropping something. Yeah, it's it's falling on the other side of the crevasse. Inside, Haworth, get that radio going. Yeah, wait, I'll go with you. C-54. C-54, come in. Come in, C-54. C-54. This is C-54. This is C-54. B-17 on the ice cap. Do you hear me? We hear you, C-54. Go ahead. This is Colonel Bernd Borchen speaking. It's Captain Monteverdi there. It's Bernd Borchen, the Arctic explorer. Here's the mic. Thanks. Is this is Captain Monteverdi? Be careful, Colonel. We're surrounded on all sides by deep crevasses. Can't land anyhow. Wind's too high. I've dropped rations, Arctic clothes, and a primus stove. Can you reach them, Captain? No, they fell on the other side of the crevasses. All right. I'll circle back and drop some more. Well, fly low. You'll have to do precision bombing. Right. I'll come down to 200 feet. How are your two injured men? Well, Spina's wrist is healing, Colonel, but O'Hara, I'm afraid... Tell him I'm all right. Well, I'm afraid O'Hara's feet are frozen. We've got to get him out of here. We have your precise location now. The dog teams couldn't make it, but we are sending out a motored sled and there's a coast guard cutter headed for the nearest shore with a Grumman amphibian aboard. We'll get there, but you've got to be patient. That's all. That's all we've got, Colonel. Patience. But don't make it too long, please. Right. I'm signing off now. Fog rolling in. So long and good luck. They fished round in the snow for those precious rations. Canned chicken, sausage, soup, and a carton of candy bars. The tea and sugar were scrambled, but they strained them apart with mosquito netting from a jungle kit. American ingenuity found use for even a jungle kit in the Arctic. November 29th, a hopeful day. By sled, by boat, by plane... Rescuers approaching. I try again. We've got to reach them, Haworth. We've got to. B-17 calling Grumman Amphibian. B-17 calling Grumman Amphibian. Come in, please. Grumman, come in. This is Lieutenant John A. Pritchard on the Grumman Amphibian from Coast Guard Cutter Clinton. Can we come down, B-17? B-17, can we come down? Captain. He wants to know if he can come down. Tell him no. Don't land, Lieutenant. Ice crevasses all around. How about further up? Is it safe there? No. You can't come down, Lieutenant. Not even using plane floats for skis? No. Captain Monteverdi says no, Lieutenant. He's going away, sir. Yes. He's going away. You are listening.
listening to The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, presenting Dean Jagger as Captain Monteverdi of the United States Army Air Corps in Nine Men Against the Arctic. As our play continues, nine Army flyers marooned on the Greenland ice cap where their plane crashed have just watched a rescue plane turn back after Captain Monteverdi advised them that a landing would be sheer suicide. But one hour later... Hey. 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 Say, did you hear what I hear? Hey, somebody's calling. They're here. They're here. Boy, is this going to be a welcome. Hey. Hey. Monteverdi? Yes, I'm Monteverdi. I'm Lieutenant Pritchard from the Grumman Amphibian. Came down a mile away. It took an hour to walk it. Well, you shouldn't have landed, Lieutenant. You may not be able to take off again. I'll have to move fast before the floats freeze in. Two are all I can carry, Captain. You? Only two? I'll be back again. Besides, a couple of motor sleds are coming over the ice cap for you. They ought to be here by midnight. Well, are you ready, Captain? No, not me. I, I want to get my sick men out. Can they walk it in this wind? We'll have to test for crevasses every inch of the way. Yes, yeah, I, I guess you're right at that. To Chirani. Yes, sir. You feel strong enough to walk that mile? Captain, I never felt strong in my life. <laughs> All right. For a year, how about you? Captain, I'm a born walker. <laughs> All right, Lieutenant. There are your men. You better get going. Goodbye, Captain. Uh, I'll be back soon. Yeah. Bye. 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 Hey, Tucheroni. Yeah. Send a wire to my folks in La Crosse. Don't forget, for a year, huh? Mrs. Lieutenant Harry E. Spencer in Dallas. November 30th. Pritchard came back in the Grumman, but Monteverdi saw a fog rolling in and sent Howarth, the farm boy, to warn him to take off at once. Howarth was to fly back with Pritchard. They wagged their wings merrily as they soared over the camp and crashed to instant death five minutes later. Now, only the sleds remain, but they did arrive. At 1 a.m., Manned by Lieutenant Demarest of the weather station and Staff Sergeant Don Tetley. Next morning... O'Hara and Spina ready to go? Yeah, I got them bundled up like papooses. Spence. Hmm? Spence, do you see something? No, what? Say, there's only one sled now. Hey! Hey, fellas, oh, quick! Everybody, step on it. Yeah? Best, oh, Vidal, bring some rope. Hey, okay, let's go. Tetley, Tetley, what happened? Where's Demarest? Gone, huh? Just like that, he's disappeared. Sled, no. Hang on to me. I'll look over there. Now, well, look out, Monty. You go in. Hang on to my legs. You see anything, Captain? Just the tail end of the tow sled. How far down? It's about 200 feet. Oh. She would never get him out. Demarest. Demarest. Can you answer, Demarest? He's gone. Just a minute ago. Keep quiet. You... Demarest! It's no use. No. Let me down on a rope, sir. We've been out here three weeks, man. We haven't the strength. Well, can't we do something, sir? A rope ladder, maybe. Well, we get enough rope. Well, we can't just leave him here. We... Gave up a good job to come out here. He knew Greenland. He loved it. And now Greenland's taken his life. Come on, boy. Come back to camp. Storms and blizzards. Not even Pappy Turner, the veteran Greenland pilot who dropped them rations, could fly. Food ran low. O'Hara, sickened with gangrene feet, began to waste away. Still the blizzard hemmed them in. Silently, each by himself, they fought despair. December. January. January 7th. 
At last, a still, clear day. With O'Hara snug in a sleeping bag on the motor sled, Spencer, Tetley, and Waddell were trudging behind, taking him out to safety. You know, I've been thinking. And this war's over, I'm gonna buy me a farm. Farm's nice if you like it, Waddell. I like it. Wife's gonna have a baby sometime this month. <laughs> He'll like it, too. Yeah. Warm enough, O'Hara? Warm? Yeah, I'm warm. How far do you say we've gone? Oh, a mile, maybe. Hey! Dale, look hey! out! Grab a sled. Wait! I can't! Hold it! I, I'm slipping! I can't! I'm... Ah! Check me quick! Gun that sled ahead! Take the sled safe here. Let's go back and look for him. See anything? Uh, not a chance. Pritchard and Howarth and Demarest. Now Adele. Greenland. He's eating us up one by one. Wife's going to have a baby sometime this month. going to buy a farm when he got back. Harris fast asleep. Hey, what's this brown stuff on the snow? Yeah, it looks like oil to me. What do you know about that? Feed lines busted. Well, can't we fix it? I doubt it. If you ask me, this sled's finished. <laughs> well, what do we do now? Dig in. Make a snow house. Wait, 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 wait. That's all we do, wait. How much can a human being endure? January passed in an agony of blizzards. February in wind drifts and nights of rootless cold. March, spring equinox, and the days going out. O'Hara delirious. Monteverde suffering from frostbite. Spina's arm healed, but he was weak and helpless. How much suffering can that bundle of muscle, nerve, and brain we call a man endure? April 5th. A Catalina flying boat dropped out of the sky. Her wheels retracted. Her wing floats lowered. Captain Monteverde. Colonel Balchin. It took us a long time, Captain. But we got here. Well, that's the main thing, Colonel. You got here. We want you and your men to drop everything now, Captain. We'll tuck you in and take care of you. I guess we won't object to that, Colonel. We're just so darn tired of fighting. Thank you, Dean Jagger. A little later, our star will return to introduce Lieutenant O'Hara, one of the real-life heroes of tonight's dramatization. Meanwhile, we want to tell you how chemical rubber is helping to defend American cities and war industry centers from hostile aircraft attack. For the first time, barrage balloons now float in the sky over vital points in American cities. They call them rubber cows, and they do look a bit like cows, but they aren't made of natural rubber. And in that fact, there's a story we think will interest you. Two years ago, the task of training men to handle barrage balloons was handed to the coast artillery. A training center was established, balloons were tested, and specifications given to manufacturers. When the Army was reorganized in March a year ago, the anti-aircraft troops were given the barrage balloons as one of their anti-aircraft weapons. That's what they are, a defensive weapon. Their cables form a sky-riding net through which an enemy bombing plane flies at the risk of having its wings torn away and its propeller entangled. 
they force the enemy bombers to fly high where the bomber's aim is poor. That's why, although it comes as news to many people, American anti-aircraft units have flown barrage balloons for more than two years, and they're flying over more than one American city tonight. Barrage balloons are sausage-shaped, with fins that keep them pointing into the wind like weather vanes. They're made of fabric treated with neoprene, DuPont's chemical rubber. Neoprene is used not merely to save rubber, but because neoprene, a man-made rubber, is much more resistant to sunlight, weather, grease, and oil than the rubber made from the sap of trees. In this particular case, man's chemistry is better than nature's. Or, as the War Department says, quote, in many respects, the neoprene balloon appears to have definite advantages over the rubberized balloon. It is believed that neoprene fabric will stand up better in the tropics than will rubber. The diffusion rate of neoprene fabric is generally more favorable than that of rubberized fabric, unquote. We of DuPont are glad the Army has found still another wartime job for one of our peacetime better things for better living through chemistry. And here is Dean Jagger, star on tonight's Cavalcade. The real star... The real stars of tonight's cavalcade are those brave men whose story we have reenacted for you tonight. And not all of those nine men came back from the Arctic. Those who did will carry the marks and scars of those harrowing months all their lives. Such a man is Lieutenant W.F. O'Hara of Scranton, Pennsylvania. In order to save his life, it was necessary to amputate both legs. Lieutenant O'Hara has left Walter Reed Hospital in Washington tonight to speak to the cavalcade audience. And it's my honor... Now, to present Lieutenant W.F. O'Hara of the United States Army Air Force. Hearing Cavalcade's reenactment of those days on the ice cap has compressed an eternity of waiting into less than half an hour. Of the seven men who came back, three, Lieutenant Spencer, Sergeant Spina, and Tucheroni, are still serving in the Ferry Command from our old base near Wilmington, Delaware. Captain Monteverdi is on duty on the West Coast. Staff Sergeant Tatley is an officer's candidate school, while Best and Purrier are on active duty. I don't know just where. And Colonel Balchin, who brought us out, is still in the Arctic. With the passage of time, I have regained some of the 100 pounds I lost in weight, and the experience grows more and more unreal. A bad dream that one wants to forget. The only reality now is the reality of the day-by-day winning of the war. Each of us has to help in his own way, and there are many ways, being blood donors, buying bonds, doing a good day's work on the production line. There isn't much one can do in a wheelchair in a hospital, and yet if I can make this one point, the need for everyone to do his utmost, that is something. Thank you, Lieutenant O'Hara. There are many roads which lead right to Tokyo. We shall neglect none of them. This is the promise of our Commander-in-Chief, a promise which recent victories in the Aleutians are bearing out. Next week, Cavalcade takes you on a shortcut to Tokyo, a vivid eyewitness account of the Battle of the Aleutians based on Corey Ford's bestseller of the same title, starring Ralph Bellamy. Don't forget, be with us next week when Cavalcade brings you Ralph Bellamy in Shortcut to Tokyo. Cavalcade is pleased to announce that Dean Jagger, star of this evening's performance, is shortly to be seen in the new Samuel Goldwyn production, North Star. The orchestra and musical score tonight were under the direction of Donald Voorhees. This is Clayton Collier sending best wishes from Cavalcade sponsor, the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company.